It's 11.02. Yeah. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. We are excited to be here today for Grand Rounds. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen to see you all, or so you can all see. And today I am really pleased to be joined by several colleagues across departments uh, to share with you our uh, ongoing project and, and um, over the course of years related to addressing mental health in primary care. And we're gonna be talking to you today about a collaborative interdisciplinary model that this wonderful group of folks has developed. Um, so as, as most of you know, I'm Katie Lingris. I'm a child psychologist and an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And I am one of the consultants and uh, PIs on this project. And so we're um, going to introduce ourselves just to give you a sense of who all is here today. Got a few pictures. Not everyone is pictured here, but we'll we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Amanda Schlesinger. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist that's been part of this team. Um, and my one of my roles is also being one of the clinical teaching consultants like Katie. Hi, I'm one of three Katies on the team. I'm Katie Cullen. And I am a child psychiatrist also and division um, um, director for child and adolescent mental health. And I just want to interject, Katie Lingris, that we are seeing a gray bar at the top of the screen right now. So maybe there's some sort of hiding you could do. But yes, I'll I pass it to that. Katie S. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Katie Steingruber. And until very recently, I was a consultant on this project. Um, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, I'm Christine Danner. I'm a psychologist by training, and I'm the director of behavioral medicine for the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health, and for specifically the Woodwinds Family Medicine Residency in Bethesda Clinic in St. Paul. We have a few team members who aren't here, but I'll just um, tell you a little bit about them. Uh, I'm Emily Borman Shope, uh, so I'll tell you about myself uh, afterwards. But we also have been really fortunate to be joined by Mary Ben Benick, who's the director of the Family Medicine Nurse Practitioner Training Program here at the University of Minnesota, and Sherry Friedrich, who's the director of the Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Training Program. Um, and Jenny Lesson, who's also not able to pre <clears throat> present with us today, is one of our developmental behavioral pediatricians. Um, I'm Emily Borman Shope. I am an associate professor in our department. I'm the residency program director and the vice chair of education. I am also a general pediatrician and have the great good fortune to collaborate and learn from Dr. Schlesinger uh, most Wednesday afternoons, and you'll hear more about that throughout our presentations. I am really delighted to um, be here with all of you today and share some of the um, really powerful collaboration that's been happening among our departments. Great, thank you everyone. And we have one more brand new consultant who's joining in just a couple of weeks, who's just joined our department, which is Amy Rooks. And um, so we're excited to have our team also growing. Um, you can see here a couple of pictures of us, a little one formal, one a little less formal of, of gathering together. Um, on the, the right was a chance we had to present to one of our state representatives. And on the left was a, a little reunion after Katie uh, Steingraber left and came back. So we'll jump into our, our content here and uh, start out with some background on where this project came from, why, uh, why we did it. Thank you. So again, Katie Cullen here, um, just setting the stage for the the um, presentation by talking, saying a few words about the kind of important problem we're trying to tackle here, which is the very high mental health needs of children and adolescents um, currently. Um, so this is, I know, a topic that is near and dear to the heart of many people and really appreciated um, by this audience. But um, mental health problems are ha very highly prevalent in children and adolescents, um, like at least one in five children experiencing a mental health or learning disorder at some point. Um, the vast majority of chronic mental health problems um, do begin in childhood or adolescence, and these problems can be very impairing, such as um, leading to dropout um, or, you know, academic performance problems. Um, and they're, they're, they rise, they, they, they grow in prevalence between across um, childhood to adolescence. And we've really seen a rise in prevalence of child of, of, of um, mental health problems 
even before the pandemic began, but since the pandemic, it's been getting worse to the point where in 2022, um, these organizations listed here, um, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association jointly declared a national emergency about child and adolescent mental health. And this is, it's not just, so the core of the matter is not just the prevalent, the high rates, but really our fields lack in capacity to address the, to meet the needs of these uh, mental health problems in youth. So um, it's a it's a national and global health issue, but here we're zeroing in on Minnesota. So if you look at the left, it's really focusing on child psychiatrists. Um, so it's like each each county you see a um, a, a shade of um, coloring that indicates the number of child psychiatrists per ten thousand. And there's you can see there's a large number of counties that have zero child psychiatrists in the entire county, and then there's more. Um, there, there's there are some counties with um, a larger number, but most counties have an extremely small, either zero or like one child psychiatrist in the entire county. So per, per 10,000 children. So um, it's a extreme shortage here in Minnesota of child psychiatrists. And of course, child psychiatry is only one small part of what, um, you know, mental health services that are, um, that are required for to support children and, and adolescents and mental health. Um, so um, on the right, we so we show more kind of like the the same kind of ratio of needs to um, available services for more of a range of services such as um, like um, crisis services, school linked mental health services, and other kinds of programs that kids need. And you can see again like the dark color is like needs are more met, light color is less uh, needs are not met in the vast majority of the state. The needs are really under. Um, under-resourced in terms of getting their needs met. <clears throat> so this is something our group has really been trying to brainstorm and focus on for a number of years. Um, and what we've been trying to think about is ways to close the gap um, through um, primary care, um, through, through bolstering um, the, um, the capacity of primary care to address some of these needs, given our you know shortage of of psychiatrists, um, and this and the reason this is a great we think this is a great opportunity is because uh, most kids do have um, a connection with a pediatric primary care provider in the United States. Ninety percent regularly visit a primary care provider, and most um, children under five receive care from a primary care provider prior to school enrollment. So this is a nice opportunity of of children interfacing with a provider. Um, <clears throat> to who could potentially um, prevent, identify, treat, etc. Um, the problem, of course, is these providers do not always feel equipped to do um, what we what we would really need. Um, so um, to to be able to identify and treat as requires a certain amount of education and training, and many of many um, of these providers don't feel like they received that kind of training in their. Um, in their education and training. So, um, and it really varies across program where some programs do provide a relatively greater amount of behavioral health education and some are, there's a lot of gaps. And the, the gaps could be things like time dedicated, depth of depth of um, knowledge that, that is offered, um, access to, to um, patients. Um, the, 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 the preceptors themselves may feel like they lack the confidence or expertise to to provide the training. Um, so there's really, um, this is where we were really trying to kind of fill this education gap um, in our collaboration through interprofessional coll collaboration and increased partnership. Over to you, KDS. All right, well, that leads us to the topic of integrated behavioral healthcare. <laughs> And before we dive in here, I think we need to sort of think about what that means when we say integrated behavioral health care. And the reality is it can mean a lot of different things. We could sort of talk for this entire um, grand round around what are the different versions of what integrated behavioral health care means or can look like. So we've highlighted a couple of the most common here, um, and I'll walk through these, but just know that how integrated behavioral health care is practiced um, around the nation and different organizations looks really different. Um, so the first one is coordinated care. This typically means that somebody in behavioral health is practicing in a separate clinic, oftentimes in a different building than 
either a primary care provider or a specialty care provider, but that there's some intentional effort for coordination. So maybe a monthly meet, monthly meeting to talk about shared patients, but that on a day-to-day -day basis, um, there is not um, formal coordination. Then there's co-located, um, which I would think about this as sort of a hallway in a clinic and maybe having someone from behavioral health and uh, for example, a pediatrician in the same hallway, but that they're seeing patients on their own. Um, and there isn't formal time set aside to collaborate. So oftentimes in co-located care, you end up with like those hallway conversations, um, but a quick question about a patient or popping your head into someone's office, like, hey, do you have a minute? Can I run this by you? But that there isn't formal time set aside to talk about shared patients. Uh, and then there's collaborative care. This is a well-established model. Um, the Ames uh, Center, which is noted, the, listed at the bottom of the slide, has done a lot of work around collaborative care. And if anyone's interested in learning more about it, you can go to their website. It's all freely available um, for clinics across the country to set up collaborative care. But this is a more population health-focused model. And it's tiered in a way that typically you have, so it's designed initially for primary care per, uh, excuse me, primary care clinics, though now is moving into specialty care clinics as well, but initially designed to have a primary care provider and then um, either a social worker or a nurse care coordinator or, or um, it's usually those two individuals um, would, would interface with the PCP, let's say once a week, and the PCP could relate to that individual, any patients that they have behavioral health concerns for. And then the role for, of the social worker or the RNCC is to connect with the behavioral health consultant about these patients, and that there would be a set aside time on a weekly, biweekly um, basis, whatever works best for the institution, where the behavioral health consultant who could be um, a psychologist, a licensed clinical social worker, a psychiatrist, the, the models, you know, can be varied, but would weigh in their recommendations for those particular patients. And then that would go back to the primary care provider. Um, really sort of the idea op is optimizing the number of patients that the BHC could weigh in on, but they're typically not seeing those patients face-to-face. And then um, the integrated behavioral health care model, which is a little bit confusing because it has the same name as the overarching title of integrated behavioral health care. But these models, if, if you're in doing an integrated behavioral health care model, what that typically means is that I'm going to use primary care as an example. Um, in a primary care clinic, there is a team of individuals providing care and that the, um, the behavioral health clinician is embedded to the point that the patients view them as part of the team they see in the primary care clinic. So um, this is often structured like as an example where like maybe the behavioral health consultant who again could be a licensed clinical social worker, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, multiple of those um, would have some scheduled patients um, in a day that they would be seen for usually short-term care. And then sometime that's not scheduled where they would be available for what's called a warm handoff, where for example, um, a, let's say a, a family medicine uh, provider sees a patient and thinks that they might benefit from, for example, seeing Dr. Danner and they want Dr. Danner to come in just really quickly to meet the patient for what's called a warm handoff so that the patient can see Dr. Danner and the handoff or the introduction came from somebody they know and trust, their family medicine provider. And then they've seen Dr. Danner's face so that the next time they come to clinic, she's not new. Um, and they know that there's a relationship already between Dr. Danner and this family medicine physician that they've, like, let's say, likely been seeing over time. Um, sometimes shared care visits happen in this model where maybe Dr. Danner, I'm going to use you as an example again, and the family medicine physician see the patient together at, at the same time. So that's the integrated behavioral health care model embedded, very team-based. And below there's um, some specific examples. So healthy steps is, it, is an example of what I would call an integrated behavioral health care model. And the, the next two PALS and MCPAP are actually examples of something I haven't talked about yet, but I think it's important, important to know about. Those are both examples of um, what's called like psychiatry access or mental health access programs that a lot of states have. Um, Minnesota has one, it's called PALS. Um, so if, you know, I think Dr. Borman-Shope can maybe speak to this. I think uh, 
a number of people in your clinic use PALS, um, and those models are great for really focused questions. So either I have this child coming in with this concern, I'm wondering what specific type of therapy you would recommend, or how could I find a therapist for this particular child who specializes in this? or uh, really focused medication questions. They're on the max dose of fluoxetine. I'd like to get them to sertraline. I don't know how to do that. Can you help me? Um, in very, very helpful services, but, but really designed for a, a focused um, question. Um, not so much getting like from a diagnostic standpoint or helping understand more of like the context of a particular situation. So important to know about a lot of states have them. Um, not listed above, but they're access programs. And then AIMS, as I mentioned already, is um, a center out of the University of Washington, and they're really focused on collaborative care. So what are the limitations of these different types of integrated behavioral health um, in terms of closing the gap that Dr. Cullen talked about? So the first limitation is money. Um, so these things cost money up front. Um, and we will talk, I think, a little bit later about, um, you know, where we see money shifting down the line. But the reality is up front, they cost money and um, systems have to be able to and um, have a desire to invest in them. Um, so they also often require, in addition to the money, um, and, and money just in terms of um, thinking about the addition of having someone new join the clinic. So if you're going to do in, like an integrated behavioral health team-based model, who will be the behavioral health consultants and how will you pay for them? Some of their time um, and arguably all of their time could be billed, but uh, it's tricky sometimes to figure out how to bill for all of the services provided in an integrated behavioral health model. Um, but on top of that, right, um, it costs money to redesign clinic models. Um, and it also takes cognitive capacity, mental capacity, and um, time for the individuals in the clinic to think about what specific model is going to be the best fit for the organization or their particular clinic, and then to design the model appropriate and then roll that out because that requires change, like a change in practice. And as we all know, change is hard and takes time and is an iterative process. So I think that's a big limitation um, as well. And then just thinking about, as I mentioned on the previous slide, right, there's a lot of different ways to do this. And so trying to even figure out what's the what's the right way for your system and your patient population and your clinic um, uh, can be hard to sort out. When we think about areas to improve, um, you know, as we collectively came together, uh, I can't remember, maybe 20 16, Dr. Cullen could maybe speak to that, but a long time ago to try to think about how could we do this in our institution? Um, what are, where are the biggest gaps? What would be a realistic model to roll out? Um, we thought about some of these ideas and one was to consider really thinking about the learners, the residents, the family, med family excuse me, the nurse practitioner learners, right? And really incorporating some of this into training. So when these individuals graduate, they're going out into the workforce having this knowledge, right? So then that can disseminate to the clinics they join, you get the snowball effect. Um, also thinking about interdisciplinary coordination. So can you strengthen your model by spreading it across disciplines? Um, and then also thinking about real-time access um, to getting mental health expertise when when you need it and when you want it um, in a primary or a specialty care clinic. So that leads us to talk a little bit more about our team specific model. And um, when this was you know, initially rolled out, really our primary goal was around increasing education for um, the primary care learners. So the pediatric residents, family medicine residents, and the nurse practitioner learners, both in family, um, uh, family medicine and um, pediatrics. Okay, so here are faces on the big screen. So this is a small, like a, a subgroup of the larger group. So I want to say there's been a, a lot of work done by our larger group, all the names listed on the first slide. Um, and um, in this, this um, slide just shows what we've named as the consultants. So this, when this started, it, um, it was Amanda Schlesinger, Katie Lingris, and myself um, as the consultants. And we covered five half days per week of um, residency clinic. 
um, and I am, have um, phased out of this program and now um, Thankfully, two new people have joined. So um, Amy Rooks, new to the University of Minnesota in December. Um, and then um, Jenny Lesson is actually, she's a developmental behavioral um, pediatrician, um, new to this project. And they will be starting um, to do real-time consultation either the end of this month or in, in March. So that's who we are. Those are our pictures. And on the other side of the screen um, are the uh, clinics uh, or the um, the clinics we serve, the patients we we serve is what I should say. So um, there's a slide. Thank you for knowing what I needed, Dr. Lingris. All right. So this is who we serve. So the clinics here, um, Bethesda Family Medicine Clinic, and then the Fairview Children's Clinic or the M Health Fairview Children's Clinic. And then we are virtually available to um, any learner in either the Bethesda Clinic or the M Health Fairview Clinic, as well as for the nurse practitioners who really are um, spread out widely across the state. So thinking about these different clinics, the Bethesda Family Medicine Clinic has 24 family medicine residents and 10 faculty who practice there. They see on average about 100 patients per day. Um, and then you can see sort of the number or the percentage of patients who um, have Medicaid insurance is over 95%. And then um, the split of their demographics below um, compared to the M Health Fairview Children's Clinic, where there are um, anywhere between 12 to 16 pediatric residents, depending on the year, who have their residency clinic there. And, um, and then five to 10 faculty preceptors. So there are more. Uh, faculty who work at that clinic, but in, when we're thinking about the preceptors for the pediatric residents, it's five to 10. They see 120 patients per day on average, and about 40% of their patients um, have Medicaid insurance. And then we broke down their patient population by age, and then you can see primary language spoke, spoken below. And then as I previously mentioned for the um, Nurse practitioner learners, they really are um, kind of scattered, scattered throughout the, the state, actually. And then this map shows where the uh, the location of the two different clinics. So the M Health Fairview Children's Clinic is um, essentially on the East Bank, very close to the East Bank campus. And then um, the M Health Fairview Clinic, uh, the Bethesda Clinic is right by the Capitol in St. Paul. All right. Um, well, it's my pleasure to um, maybe take a walk down memory lane or sort of um, share with you a little bit about how this group came together, um, some of the work we've been trying to do to get um, funding for this project. Um, and you perhaps have heard somebody say, maybe it was even back to 2016, so you can do the next slide, um, KDL. Um, the, uh, this is also what I tell all of my patients and my children. If you ever post something on social media or send an email, you should just imagine it on a billboard because once you send it, it's not in your control anymore. So in 2016, um, George Real Muto, who will be well known to many in your department, sent an email that said the American Academy of Pediatrics recognizing the crisis in mental health access because of workforce shortages has just released this announcement. This is the leverage we need to bring mental health care to every family from the earliest of symptom formation. Please see below. Dr. Cullen wrote back, I agree, it's part of our strategic plan. We've been working on it. Um, maybe this will help facilitate that effort. So I um, returned from taking an actual break over the holidays, sorting through many emails and you know, sort of found this uh, really important idea for collaboration. You can hit the next slide. Um, just to make that box disappear, KDL. Um, and so we just started meeting without a clear um, end in mind. If you hit advanced, Katie Lingris, it'll take that email off of there so we can see the timeline. Thanks. Um, so we just started meeting and talking about, well, what would it look like? How could we work together? And we had really broad collaboration between developmental behavioral ped, psychology, psychiatry, the pediatrics department. We worked directly with um, elected officials from the get-go. We found some really amazing legislative champions who were interested in the work that we were doing. And we learned a lot uh, about what to do and what not to do in terms of uh, 
advocating for state funding and um, how we could uh, try to get a project started. Um, and uh, so we kind of started in small steps and I think really our project was informed you know, by the direct experience I have as a general pediatrician as the and the director of the residency program, really trying to think about something that we could have proof of concept and start uh, where the learners are and where the patients are. Um, so we, uh, some of that initial work um, ha started at the Bethesda Woodwinds Clinic with a Medica grant and then the medical school, if some of you may remember, put out some kind of starter funds um, that were these academic investment uh, grant programs back in 2020. And so our um, group came together and put together a, a couple of proposals that were selected for funding. And that really helped to jumpstart our work because as Dr. Steingraber pointed out, this costs money. It costs money to have a mental health professional available either to see patients or to provide teaching. And I think the really unique thing about this model is their only job is to teach. They don't have patient care responsibilities. They don't have to answer their Epic in basket. They can just be ready at any time. Because I think that's one of the challenges with the more integrated behavioral health models is that they've the mental health care provider has their own patients to see. So they can't sit around and really bring somebody up to speed on how to taper off of one SSRI and onto the other because they don't have time to do that. Um, so we got this medical school money that got us started. And in the background, we really partnered um, with NAMI. And I think really we're fortunate to learn a lot from the leadership at NAMI about how to advocate and how we might use our voices at the Capitol to encourage investment by the state. Um, and kept our eyes out for other opportunities. And I think having our project kind of packaged and put together for the work we did with the medical school really helped us to be ready when other funding opportunities um, came around. Um, we didn't put on there that we did do a HRSA grant in 2022, which is a huge amount of work for anyone who's done those. We unfortunately did not get that funding, but we got a very high score, I think, because of the um, you know, background and proof of concept that we already had in place. And then we've been really fortunate to get um, already some funding from Minnesota Department of Health um, under the umbrella of health professions expansion. And that's where our interprofessional team and interdisciplinary team really paid off because it allows us to access funding and support um, that may be geared towards almost any primary care provider because we're really meeting all of those needs. And then I think, you know, one of the most exciting things for our group is that really based on a lot of our advocacy and partnership with NAMI, there's new money available at the state to support pediatric mental health education. And so um, we have most recently applied for that funding and We'll hope to get positive news from them um, soon, within the next few weeks. So I can tell you a little bit about those MDH um, grants. That Health Professions Expansion Grant was a $300,000 grant uh, over two years that really allowed us to um, kind of strengthen the way we were working with the nurse practitioner trainees. As we mentioned, their clinical placements are kind of all over the place. Many of them are quite rural in their placements. And so they um, really need, need to use the Zoom consult access. But one of the things that we found is it was a little too passive, just sort of letting them know it was available and providing encouragement wasn't enough. And so as a part of this grant, we actually put in a lot of effort to schedule teaching time and schedule opportunities for them to come and participate in teaching and consultation. I think that's been really positive so far. Um, the most recent grant that we put in, I think really was a product of what we've learned over the last couple of years is how important it is to empower the primary care teachers to let their trainees do appropriately supervised mental health care and primary care. And so we hope to put on um, some workshops for primary care teachers so that they can build their own skills in mental health care and be ready to teach the next generation and bring some of those same um, key concepts to our current learners.
All right, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Schlesinger to talk a little bit more about the work we did with the legislature. Yeah, so apologies for my voice here. Um, these conversations with legislators, as previously described, <clears throat> began back in 2018, 2019, after, you know, relationship building, and I was just coming on board at that time. And so um, there were meetings to describe the needs, advise on bill language for a grant that would have been specific for the University of Minnesota, um, you know, providing funding to develop this program. So that was initially heard through a higher education committee and then transferred over to HSS. And that ended up being a less fruitful path forward. And we did some testimony. We learned a lot about how to put together stories that were impactful. We gathered some interest, but that bill did not move forward in that session. And we received lots of wise counsel from Sue Abderholden saying, this is really a four to five year process to um, build discussions, get these ideas out there and keep strategizing. And then in the 2023 session, which was really a fortuitous session for many ideas moving forward, um, NAMI and the Mental Health Legislative Network, which is a broader umbrella organization of many local um, organizations, you know, that would include Washburn, Frazier, et cetera, where NAMI advocacy is a large part of that. I'm simplifying. Um, they advocated for a more comprehensive workforce development bill with several um, programs within it. Um, including um, a grant that would be administered by MDH for programs like ours um, that went via human services. So we went to many hearings and we were able to do faculty and some pediatric learner testimony, which was great, where they were able to talk about what we've already done with our pilot. Um, and so this bill moved forward and then it was eventually included in the omnibus bill. So funding was allocated to this and then MDH developed an RFP for it and the application process opened and we submitted our proposal. All right, so I am going to sort of then shift us back to what what does it actually look like real time, what we're doing? Um, and this slide shows sort of the two big categories. So case-based educational consultations um, and then educational tools, which I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit more about each one of these on slides to come. All right. Sorry, I need to shift my screen a little bit. All right. So educational tools, I want to just say quickly that um, in, um, in the next couple of slides, we'll talk about the real-time consultations. And our educational tools really came about after we had done real-time consultations for a bit of time. We started seeing, uh, we were um, collecting data, right, on, on the consultations we were receiving. What were we, what were people asking about? What were, what were they most interested in? What did they already know? What were they really hungry to learn more about? Um, and realize that we were, you know, there was a frequency with, with some of these things. And we thought putting together some educational tools that would offer asynchronous learning might be really helpful. Um, and so we uh, came up with this idea for um, pediatric pearls for mental health that we came together to do as our larger group would, would write these up on a monthly basis initially. And you can see um, uh, some of the topics that we have covered with, a pedi with our pediatric pearls. And then these were sent out <clears throat> to the... Um, family medicine residents, the pediatric uh, resident, all of the pediatric residents, um, and then nurse practitioner learners as well, um, so that they could reference these um, when, when questions came up or store them away somewhere like in a file on their computer for when they go into practice and they wanna be able to, to go back and, and reference these. And so they're really designed um, to provide some education for the primary care providers and then include talking points to use with patients um, and families. And then we try to be pretty heavy on the resources at the bottom of these pearls so that if, um, you know, if a particular individual was really interested in the topic that they had opportunity to go and learn um, more about it, more than what we were able to include in, in the pearl. So this slide um, shows, there, it's an older slide um, with data we collected after we had rolled out a number of pearls, just to see 
were people opening these, right? They were coming out via email. And what we could track was how frequently the newsletter was opened. It wasn't perfect because you couldn't quite tell if it was the same individual opening or had somebody forwarded this on to someone that we that we hadn't initially sent the pearl to, but it was at least an idea of um, were they sitting unopened in all the in baskets they were sent to or were people actually interested enough um, to, to open them and look at them. And you can see at the very bottom, <clears throat> it indicate this slide indicates the number of residents it was sent out to um, and, and p-learners it was sent out to as well. All right, and then case-based educational consultation. I have to like try hard not to get too excited about this slide. This is one of my favorite parts. It was like probably the favorite part of um, my work was being able to do these case-based educational consultations. So you can see here this lovely picture of Dr. Lingris at um, Bethesda Family Medicine Clinic um, demonstrating for us like what, what this would look like, right? And so we um, the goal was to really be available in staffing rooms. So here, this is a staffing room at Bethesda where the residents sit and then the two um, preceptors um, sit where they're staffing the family medicine residents. Um, and our the way we would structure, structure this, right, was to sort of skim the schedule at the beginning of a clinic day, try to highlight patients that we thought it might be worth kind of um, weighing in on, um, but then also being um, really actively listening to the conversations going on in the team room. And this uh, picture here doesn't really, um, this is a busy room. <laughs> so this was done, I think, after hours or before the clinic started, but typically there are um, many residents sitting in this room and there's a lot of hustle and bustle and a lot of conversation going on. So a lot of opportunity to sort of hear things that you think, you know what, maybe I could weigh in there. And so oftentimes we were looped in, requested to be um, looped into the staffing uh, process. And sometimes we sort of inserted ourselves into the staffing process when it seemed that maybe um, like it would be appropriate. Um, and so the, what, what this would look like really varied. So it could be, you know, weighing in on, you know, how to handle a difficult behavior in a child. It could be weighing in on um, struggling with a diagnosis, how to have, how to, how to get the information that you need to, to feel like you can make a diagnosis. So sometimes we'd be offering additional ideas around how to take a, a history and ask really difficult questions. Um, so it could look a really, really different. Like every, every half day I had looked different. I want. I do want to highlight what Dr. Borman Chope said is that we were not seeing patients real time. Our work was all being done with the residents and the learners and the faculty in a teaching role for them the, for that individual if they needed to to go back to the patient and carry out what we had just talked about. But we were we were not um, directly seeing the patients. Um, and then as part of this, right, and we started to collect data on a number of consults being received. We really identified that this model was not quite working well for the NP learners. Um, and I'll talk about sort of how we um, modified our, yeah, that's okay, Katie, you can go on, Mod our model to try to um, make it more accessible for the NP learners as well. So this slide highlights um, our early experience with consults, identifies the number of consults completed and the most common topics that we were asked about, um, anxiety, depression, and self-harm and suicidal thoughts. We also realized that for us to be um, to increase our accessibility for people, um, we uh, needed to be available um, outside of those five half days. And so we developed an epic pool for asynchronous consult. So people either prepping for clinic ahead of time could ask um, people doing notes, you know, in the evening after clinic, if something came to their mind, they could send a message to the epic pool. And so Dr. Lingris, Dr. Schlesinger and I were on, um, on that pool and now uh, the other two new consultants will also be monitoring that pool for any non-urgent consult questions. And that proved to be really helpful for um, especially clinics when we were not physically present. So when, when they had virtual access to us, oftentimes we would um, get these the, the pool messages from those clinics. And as I previously mentioned, um, really um, a, a lot of utilization by medical residents. And it was more challenging for us to really reach out to the nurse practitioner learners. This slide um, identifies, as I talked about, the, 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 top can, the top consult questions on the previous slide. This outlines the number of um, a number of other topics that we were asked about. And oftentimes it would be a multi, you know, 
many of these at one time. Um, so like three different things um, coming in, but this is kind of the breadth of what, of what we were talking about in clinic. And I will turn it over to Dr. Borman Schultz. Hey, I, um, I think you probably will get the um, idea of what we're talking about, but I thought I might just share a few specific examples that pop to mind of the types of patients that um, we would talk about. Um, so uh, an example is a 17-year-old patient who had no previous mental health concerns. And, um, you know, one of the things that I love about being a primary care provider is, you know, this is a patient I've known since he was three years old. He's 17 now. And his mom reached out and said, I'm really worried. I, he's really going through a tough time. And so I was able to get him fit in to see him quickly. And um, I don't need to tell a bunch of psychiatrists how to diagnose an episode of major depression. Um, but it was pretty bad. He was having a lot of thoughts of self-harm that were unwanted. And it was really impacting his daily life. And that's probably a patient that before uh, becoming good friends with so many mental health providers, I might've said like, Ooh, I better send you to see a psychiatrist. This sounds serious. And uh, it, instead I, you know, popped out and talked to Amanda and said, you know, here's, here's what he's experiencing. I, I think I want to start him on this medication, you know, any recommendations for therapy. And we were able to you know, start treatment that same day as the visit. There was zero weight in him getting appropriate treatment and referrals for his condition. And he's doing amazing now. He's, you know, been able to wean off of his medications. He didn't have to go meet a new provider that he'd never met before. He didn't have to miss more school. He didn't have to wait for six months. Next slide. Um, this is a, uh, another patient that I've known for a long time who had, um, been on long-term SSRI and wasn't helping enough. So I tried increasing the dose and, um, they started having really intrusive, very specific thoughts of self-harm. And the parent asked, do you think this is because of the medication? I'm like, yeah, maybe. And, Again, that's a patient where I might have felt stuck before. You know, well, what's the next step? Do I have to go down to a lower dose? Do I go to a different med? And just the fact that I could literally, you know, turn 90 degrees and have access to an expert who's like, yeah, this does happen. Here's the one I would switch to. Here's what you can tell the family to expect and, you know, make an adjustment to her care within 15 minutes instead of this young person struggling with a medication that wasn't working for them and causing unwanted side effects. Next slide. Um, this is a very recent one. Um, Katie Lingris comes to clinic as I am leaving on Monday mornings and you know, I'll get a lot of questions like, oh, somebody recommended that I do this kind of therapy. It makes me feel better when I'm like, is this even a thing? And she was able to say, well, that's not really like the specific name, but um, we were able to have this great conversation about, yes, exposure therapy is a tool. Here's the kinds of places I would usually use that, but here's the other considerations that I would be thinking about for this patient and where you should start next. And so again, I was able to go back to the family with really high quality advice about what they should do next for their child and where they should seek care instead of having them floundering around Googling and trying to find the right fit for their child. And so I think that's been the, um, you know, real magic for me is, um, you know, building my own skills, quite frankly. I've been a pediatrician for 15 years, but I think there's so many providers out in practice who have to flip that switch and just say mental health is health. Depression has diagnostic criteria and a expected treatment plan, just like asthma does. But I think they're, every pediatrician you find is glad to treat asthma, but there's a good chunk of pediatricians who aren't ready to treat depression. And that's what we're trying to do is get everybody ready to start appropriate treatment, make the appropriate referral so that some good portion of these patients never come to your department. They stay in my department. Next slide. 
Um, so we wanted just to show you a little bit. This was such a powerful opportunity for us to advocate and give our um, trainees a chance to share their voice at the state capitol. So this is um, from some of the testimony um, in the spring of 2023 that um, led to um, that funding being written into the omnibus bill. And so we know the volume on here is a little bit quiet. So if you're on your individual device, feel free to amp up the sound now. We'll share this link as well afterwards. Thank you, Chair Noor and the committee for this opportunity to speak. I'm Abigail Schnaith. I am the pediatric chief resident at the University of Minnesota. I'm a board certified pediatrician and in my final year of training. I'm a resident selected to supervise the education of the pediatric residency. Over 70% of practicing pediatricians in the state of Minnesota receive their training here at the University of Minnesota. Right now, there's a pilot program at the University of Minnesota in the primary care pediatric setting where mental health professionals serve as teachers for residents and other primary care providers in real time. Section six will provide ongoing funding for this important work. I will never forget a young male who was so anxious he couldn't start his college applications. The inability to start an application hurt his self-esteem and made him angry to the point that he was punching walls at home and getting in fights with family members. He came to me in primary care for a routine checkup and brought up his concerns. We identified that the patient had general anxiety disorder and decided to start medications. I needed help how to see finding out how to safely and effectively help this patient in crisis. Having a psychiatrist as a resource helped me feel confident starting a medication, increasing a medication dose, or changing medications for him, rather than referring him to a psychiatrist where he would have spent many months waiting to see a provider. Waiting many months for care would have been a detriment to him and his family financially and emotionally, and he likely would have missed submitting his college applications. Instead, his anxiety became under control. He completed his applications, and he is now succeeding in college. I have used the knowledge I learned from this, the mental health consultant during this case and applied it to other patients. This program will allow patients to receive efficient mental health care and build the skills the providers need to continue this work. It is a benefit to trainees, the future physicians of Minnesota, our patients, and our future patients. Thank you. All right, so I am going to uh, share a little bit more about some outcomes. Oops. Thank and as you, you may have noticed already, this pr uh, presentation has not been particularly data heavy. We've really relied on some of these stories like you just heard from Dr. Borman Shope and Dr. Schnaith. And I think, you know, honestly, these are some of the things that are the most uh, compelling, certainly for legislators, but even to think about uh, for sharing our for sharing our, our own experiences and our own outcomes. Uh, these are the, the ways in which we're really making a difference in not only uh, trainees and, and their faculty preceptors, but also the lives of patients across the state. So really practically speaking, when we first started with this project, um, it was really actually a feasibility study. So we it was a pilot project. We didn't know if it was gonna work. We didn't know how best it was going to work. So most of our questions that we were really looking at were around feasibility, acceptability, and sustainability. So could this work for its intended purposes? How do we develop a model that, that gets at all of those intended purposes? Creating something that works within a clinic setting, right? So especially for those of us who were coming from a psychiatry and behavioral sciences clinic, it's a really different uh, environment than primary care. Certainly there's overlap, but we're effectively inserting ourselves as a new component into this well-oiled machine. And so we wanted to make sure that all of the uh, trainees and all of the faculty preceptors and the patients weren't being negatively affected, but rather that we were creating a, a new kind of addition to the system that was helpful. Um, so then we also wanted to look at, you know, what modalities and what models really optimize the use of this service. And so you've heard a little bit about that um, through the presentation today in terms of some of the tools that we've added for educational purposes and some of the additions that we've made to our program. Uh, particularly looking at that interdisciplinary lens. So the most recent addition, uh, that most recent application that we've put in uh, for MDH and the, the current funding is really thinking about how do we optimize the use of services, particularly for the nurse practitioner learners who weren't accessing us as much as they could be. And then how do we sustain this work in the long term? So how do we get beyond this grant funding? 
And I'll talk about a little bit more about these, these pieces in detail in a moment. Um, we also wanted to look at the learner impact. So you just heard a story from Dr. Snaith about the impact that our services had on her practice and her overall, and this particular patient that she worked with, but also her overall practice, her overall skills. And so we wanted to learn, you know, how do learners access and learn from these consultations? Uh, are there trends to the types of questions that come up to, again, inform, uh, as you heard, the educational uh, materials like the pediatric pearls and other types of trainings that might be needed? Um, and what kinds of resources, again, both in content and format are the most useful? Long term, this wasn't really a current question um, from our current grant, but long term, we're also thinking about um, this, this gap in care, right? So we ultimately want to be able to increase children's access to mental health care, both in frequency um, and, and location. So as Dr. Borman Shope said, are there cases where, you know, kids actually don't come to our clinic and freeze up slots for the kids who really do need to come because their, their um, diagnoses and their situations are so complex that they're no longer being able to be managed in primary care. So those are things we're looking at in the long term, but in this current, uh, these current projects, these last few years, um, we've been looking at that feasibility and acceptability. So we've learned a lot about the realities of primary care. And I think really excitingly for a lot of us, um, it's been really bi-directional. So um, those of us who serve as consultants are going into a primary care clinics, uh, which we you know don't typically practice in. So we're learning a lot about what patients are experiencing even before they get to uh, us when they're getting referred in the first place. And then we're also able to share a lot of information as you've heard in some of these stories with the residents, with the faculty, um, who are learning, uh, who are talking with the families initially about mental health. Uh, it, it's also helped us really develop this model for consultation. So creating uh, partly out of circumstance, our, our very first grant um, or the AIEP grant rather um, started in 2020 and we got funded approximately a week or two before the pandemic hit. And so we had to kind of pivot and, and begin our consultation virtually. Uh, but that actually ended up shaping our model of how we we're able to offer services, not only in person, but being able to be available virtually as well. And that lent really nicely to the, the collaboration across disciplines too. As you heard, our nurse practitioner learners are scattered across clinics across the, not only the metro area, but the state. And so coming into a clinic or even us going to them wasn't really logistically feasible, but they do now have access to us on a regular basis through those virtual consultations. It's also been a nice way to really think across multiple different uh, care primary care clinics. So again, nurse practitioner, trainees, family me medicine residents, pediatric residents, uh, and really thinking about what does each discipline bring to the table? What, ex what is already going on in terms of mental health or child development? And what kinds of things can we learn from one another? You heard a lot today earlier about our timeline and the different kind of mechanisms of funding that we have received so far. And this has been really wonderful to think about um, kind of continuing our work in the short term um, through these grant funded projects and through state funded projects. Uh, but we also wanted to think more long term too, in terms of how might this be integrated into our larger system. Um, and we're at kind of a tricky point right now, just in terms of the um, financial climate and what could be hardlined into um, our system overall. But it is something that we've um, started conversations about and likely will continue after we get over some of these uh, financial bumps over the next couple of years. So there's definitely interest in thinking about this at, at the larger system level as well. And then we've been able to disseminate our work so far um, through national conferences, through a manuscript, and again, kind of really giving us an opportunity to work across disciplines and even get to go to some conferences outside of our typical disciplines and learn from one another um, and our colleagues there as well. Now, the one of the big areas that we've talked about is really wanting to have these impacts on our learners. So you've heard some numbers already about the number of um, trainees who are impacted by this project. And again, this is probably an underestimate thinking about the number of people who come through each year and then the number of people that they might go talk to. Uh, but really importantly, many of our trainees across these different programs go on to practice somewhere in Minnesota. So in the state of Minnesota, we're also increasing overall knowledge um, in communities and particularly communities where there may not be access to those, um, those child psychiatrists or mental health providers or services, as Dr. Cullen shared early on. So we're really increasing capacity, and that's our one of our ultimate goals in, in working with learners. And we're also bridging some of these relationships across primary care and the community to some of these specialty care, mental health expertises that we are able to offer and kind of building these relationships both through this project and through the clinics as well. As well. 
So in order to look at some of these questions, I'm gonna give you just a little taste of data here. These are some of the baseline kinds of things that we looked at. Um, so we're having all of the trainees who are participating in the consultations in these programs um, give us some idea. First of all, you know, from, from a background standpoint, where do you typically get your training related to mental health issues for children? Um, and we asked actually our faculty preceptors as well. And so not surprisingly, you can see lectures and talks or CME um, activities are really common. Um, clinical settings and classroom trainings are also a big piece of it. Um, but then you can see actually an interesting difference between faculty and learners that skills-based trainings or workshops are much more common for faculty to go to than residents or trainees. So that was a really nice kind of opening for us to bring in a program like this, where it's really, um, it's not a, a workshop per se, but it's hands-on in, in vivo skill, skills-based training with their actual cases. And so we're gathering this information over time again to inform what kinds of modalities are most useful. Another thing that we looked at at baseline was um, how often are folks actually encountering mental health concerns within their visits? And so again, you um, not surprisingly are seeing higher numbers in blue here. Those are the faculty respondents. Uh, but then those, um, those orange numbers here where the highest are one to five encounters per month. Um, and those are residents and trainees responding saying they're, they're only seeing a handful of them. Now, what we're looking at over time, and this is difficult to, to show causally, certainly, but um, we, can, we can absolutely say this anecdotally, is a lot of the reason that those numbers were so low was not necessarily because those concerns didn't exist, but because the trainees didn't know how to ask about them, or they didn't know what to do once they asked about them. So we hear over and over again, both from faculty and trainees, that we don't want to ask these questions if we don't have a good answer, and we don't know what to do with the information that we get back. So part of our consultation was really to help um, give that knowledge so that people feel comfortable asking about mental health concerns within a primary care visit, and then also have those answers as to where to go for the next steps. And then finally, we're looking at how prepared do folks feel um, to look at different aspects of children's mental health concerns. Um, and again, these, are, these four different colors here just indicate the different pr training programs. And we'll, we're looking at this over the course of time. So we'll, we ideally will see growth over the course of the year uh, as, as trainees and, and faculty have, or as trainees rather, have um, access to our consultation. We're hoping that they show, they feel more prepared to uh, recognize signs or symptoms related to children's mental health and that they are able to ask appropriate questions to identify mental health concerns. And in cases where there are concerns present that we're able to make those safety plans, make appropriate referrals. And again, you can see this was a seven point scale and most of these responses are in kind of the slightly paired moderate slightly prepared, moderately prepared range. And we'd really like to see those numbers a lot higher. And so that again is what part of our work is really getting at is helping these trainees feel more prepared to um, ask these questions, to identify concerns, and then to help take those next steps. So the final piece that I'll talk about here is this patient impact. And, um, and Dr. Steingraber touched on this earlier, just the, the sheer numbers. We've had many, many consultations over the, the number of years here, and we're learning a lot about what kinds of concerns are coming up, uh, both for families and also where trainees are feeling like they want some extra input. Um, so again, depression and mood concerns, anxiety, learning ADHD, uh, trauma behavior problems. Those are you know what we probably would expect, kind of the top concerns that typically come up for kids. Um, but we also are getting questions about um, therapy and mental health services. So just general understanding of what happens once I refer a family for therapy, what kinds of therapy are we talking about? What therapy is most appropriate for what type of concern as Dr. Borman Shope was talking about with that eight-year-old. And then we're also seeing questions and, and concerns uh, in those consultations related to autism spectrum, sleep, developmental concerns, and again, just kind of general mental health topics. So we might have someone come in uh, just a couple days ago, for, for instance, we uh, spent a whole bunch of time talking about um, how do we talk with parents of newborns about parental mental health and um, even some ethical questions about how do we document when concerns come up, given that the patient is actually the child in this scenario, but we're then talking about adult concerns about their own mental health. So some really interesting things that, you know, are drawing in both the, the trainees and the faculty preceptors. And, and often in this case, you know, I was able to then give some resources for some of our very own programs in our, our department, the Women's Wellbeing uh, Program. 
And, um, and then we're able to make those connections too for some resources that might be available when these concerns do come up. So in the future, we um, in our future grants and, and down the road, we're also looking at how do we um, how do we how are we able to increase those identifications of mental health services? Um, how are we able to increase referrals for mental health services where needed? Um, and this one's a little bit tricky because on, on some level, you know, you you might think you want to see the referrals go down, but actually, if the referrals are going up, that means that we're likely going we're likely doing a better job of identifying the concerns when they're present. Um, and certainly in the current climate, we know that mental health has has only become a higher need for young ch for children of all ages. Um, across these last few years post-pandemic. Uh, we also, as you heard earlier, really want to work on closing those gaps in the care access. So um, reductions in needing to go to the ED or higher level of care, um, especially for those for whom that isn't necessarily needed, you might be able to address some of those concerns in primary care or in outpatient. Again, that makes space for those really severe cases that do need that level of care. And a lot of what we're looking at here in terms of the patient impact are things that we're seeing and, and would expect to see through that um, learner and provider impact. So for example, provider confidence in identifying mental health needs. So we're gonna spend just a, a few minutes here uh, talking about things that we've learned in this project, and then uh, we'll wrap up and, and open it up for questions as well. All right, thank you. Um, so a few sites here and lessons learned. So the first one is just a bit of reflection on the remote versus in-person consultation experience. And as Dr. Lingris mentioned, um, due to the timing of when we initially um, received uh, our first um, grant um, being right at the start of COVID, we rolled this out virtually, um, and then we're able to offer in-person um, consultation down the road. And at that, when, when that became available to us, we decided to keep this as a hybrid model so that we could be in-person in a particular clinic and at the same time be available virtually to um, those clinics that we were not physically in. Um, and the opportunity, uh, the opportunities we had when we were virtual was that we could serve multiple clinics at the same time. In theory, we, we were uh, available virtually for, for a number of clinics. Um, it also allowed us to um, um, do teaching to different learners at the same time. And so thinking about um, how, when we were trying to increase um, our, um, um, our education for the NP learners, right? Um, and we've mentioned that um, the additional model we rolled out, we were struggling, um, but then we offered set formalized time for them to join us on um, either in-person or virtually. And that allowed them to be somewhere out like rural, um, Part of the northern, you know, in northern Minnesota, but to join us virtually and hear and see us be physically present in another clinic. And that was also a really nice opportunity. Um, it allowed us um, to also review charts from a number of different clinics, but we then would use um, messages in Epic to, to send them to a particular learner or um, faculty member to say, hey, the, the patient at 210, I'd be interested in joining and staffing for. Um, and so could increase our access virtually that way. There were some challenges, um, right? We realized initially that when we weren't there physically in clinic, some clinics accessed us less. Um, that's part of why we developed the pool um, as well and part of why we started reviewing charts before the afternoon of clinic and sending out these messages to say, hey, I'm here, I'm virtually available. I'd love to chime in for your three o'clock patient. Um, you can see the, the other challenges there. I think in this, for the sake of time, I will hop onto the next slide briefly. Um, and then just some of the lessons learned and some of the questions that we're still kind of pondering, right? And so the clinics that we're in are really busy. Um, patient visits um, are quick. Uh, there's not a lot of time to build in for consultation. So learning process for us too, right? How do we provide some expertise in a short period of time um, that can feel meaningful for the, for the learners? Um, thinking about the spillover effect. So how does our conversation with a, a learner or resident spill over to the faculty who's there, who then spills over to like the patients they're seeing down the road or for the resident or the learner in the clinic they move to after they graduate? Um, thinking about um, intentionality, I'll skip to the bottom here, in communication was really important too. So the reality of us um, sending out a message to say, hey, don't forget, you have access to us this afternoon in clinic, but it's virtual, here's the link. We found that being more intentional um, was really helpful. So these 
sometimes we even call the clinic. I'm at the start of clinic to say, hi, I'm virtually available. I looked at the schedule. These are the patients that I think I could weigh in on. Don't be, af- you know, don't be afraid to hop on if you have other thoughts or sending epic messages really was helpful uh, for the days that we are virtually available. I think you can move on to the next slide, Dr. Lingris. So um, I am going to highlight one thing Katie Stengraber didn't say, which is the benefit of a project coordinator. I don't think we would have been able to get this done without having an excellent project coordinator. Greta Alquist, who has been invaluable. And if we hadn't had somebody to keep an eye on all of these moving pieces, I don't think we would have been as successful at all. Um, Very briefly, next steps. So funding steps, we have the AIEP through this year, the MDH starting this year, and then we're in process there. Looking forward for what other funding opportunities federally state might come up that we can keep in our side view mirrors. Analysis, we're moving forward with these pre and post data analysis, visit tracking analysis as we were showing, and exploring um, qualitative measures and or cost savings analyses as well. And then as we look forward to expanding our reach and influence and projects, we're working on this clinical expansion grant with the NP program being like, all right, we're trying out these different shadowing and virtual um, shadowing models of getting them involved in the busy primary care peds clinics and those discussions. We, um, in that proposal for MDH was this new training workshop with focus group guided content choices, making sure we're delivering what people want at the level they want it. That's really gonna be high yield and worthwhile. And we've also been thinking about um, getting through some of the IT challenges of uh, developing a smart phrase library for Epic use throughout our system where people can be like, what did we talk about about that thing? Oh yeah, I'll grab it. Oh good, this is that list of uh, sleep resources, you know, so great things to think about. So thanks everyone for listening. And now we're going to move on to Q&A. Wonderful. Thanks everyone. So this hopefully gave you an idea of our project and also the, the number of folks and disciplines that are involved in this work. And it's really been a rewarding experience for all of us. Um, and now we would love to hear from all of you. So we, I believe, have this set up as a Q&A. So Dr. Borman is going to help us moderate um, what kinds of questions may have come up? And I'm going to stop sharing so we can at least see one another if, and you can see all of us a little bit better as well. Um, all right. So first question, how could a pharmacist fit into this practice model um, beautifully, if you know any pharmacists or pharmacy residents who are looking for something to do on Monday through Thursday afternoons, um, I, I think that would be a welcome addition. And uh, a lot of it, what we talk about depends a little bit on who's the consultant for the day. So I think we talk a lot about pharmacotherapy um, on the days when our psychiatrists are serving as the consultants. But I, I think that's a wonderful next step to consider and could be great learning for a pharmacy person in training as well. I just want to chime up that um, Bethesda is lucky enough we do have integrated pharmacy in our clinic. Um, I think they tend to be utilized more for management of diabetes and asthma and other things and um, might sometimes be pulled into the mental health side, but I think there's room for growth there as well. So, and it is a highly valued service in our clinic. They are very popular and well utilized. Looks like there's a question in the room. Is it my turn? Can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Sure. Um, th- thanks for this presentation. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Lionel Weninger, I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, I work with the early psychosis programs here. Um, Sophia and I actually had a kind of similar thought to ask about um, early psychosis and clinical high risk for psychosis. I saw from the, the chart presented that it was very few, it was very low on the list of um, complaints or reasons for the consultation, hallucinations and thoughts of psychosis. But I would expect there to be, um, at least for the mental health professionals, uh, looking at patients coming in to see a, a few more um, potential signs of, of early psychosis, either perceptual disturbances, um, changes in functioning, things like that. So I'm, I'm curious if there was uh, this is something we're thinking about on our end that we need to kind of increase our education uh, to the community and to providers about um, early signs. So I'm, I'm curious if that at all came up. 
deep discussions. I don't know if Amanda will remember this day, probably. Um, that came up kind of by accident once when a patient thought they were getting scheduled at the early psychosis clinic and in fact got scheduled with a continuity resident who was a second year peds resident and um normally that would have been like very stressful for the peds resident to be like oh my gosh like i can't give them the help they need i don't even know where to start and I think that's another thing that we probably didn't highlight enough is like all the um, systems connections between MIDB and Department of Psychiatry and like, oh, I didn't even know there was this clinic and that you write to this person in Epic who can grease the wheels and get someone in. But on that day, having a child psychiatrist right there could help us be like, okay, well, let's really talk about this. Like, is this actually psychosis like what you know and I think just helped us really break it down and gather a much more detailed mental health history and help get that family pointed in the right direction and so I think that's one of the um, big skills that we're building is a skilled mental health history taking and sending patients to the right place for what their needs are. And I would just add, maybe, you know, maybe this wasn't um, tracked, you, you know, uh, maybe we could think about tracking this differently moving forward. So I really appreciate the question. I, um, I actually felt like I did a lot of discussing. So a question coming to me as like a six-year-old um, who is psychotic and that transition to the conversation around, well, let's think about the differential of other things that we would think about in the six-year-old child, right? Rather than this being, you know, a first break of uh, psychotic illness. And so I think those conversations I certainly had, but when I would track that, I didn't include that as psychosis, if that makes sense. But that's certainly something we could talk about um, in uh, discussion moving forward. Yeah, sort of I mean, symptom-based rather than diagnosis-based, it will probably be helpful that's, potentially. That's true. I think what's also really interesting is that early psychosis is so forefront of our minds. Being in the mix in a primary clinic you start to see the true low incidence in the population compared to my child can't sleep, my child's falling behind in reading. And so we're both trying to really focus in on like those really common issues and make sure to sh that everyone's screening skills are strong. So when the zebra comes, they're ready to see it, triage it, recognize it, escalate it. But we definitely had that day a really meaningful discussion about hallucinations that may be associated with early trauma, um, you know, rather than true early psychosis. Um, and that was a really interesting day that ended up turning it really well for that family, so. Thank you for this. And um, yeah, I'll just say, you know, even in that one instance, having a, a resident or having a learner in, as part of that discussion, uh, you're potentially reaching 10, 20 families, right? And so it's um, even, even in kind of low, low numbers, uh, that, that's really, really helpful and, and important. So thank you. Yeah, I want to call out one thing here that I'm hearing in the content of the discussion that maybe we didn't pull out on a slide is the, the benefit to the primary care providers, mental health and well-being of mm -hmm. being able to share complex cases like these and stressful clinical presentations that maybe they don't feel quite ready to address on their own. I think that that is a huge boon. Um, so just for the well-being of the team, as well as for the improved clinical care for the patients and families, I think that's another whole layer. We could talk about that all day too. Yeah. And I would just add to when we, um, I had initially said, right, that there's um, the cost upfront is significant, but there are many ways to consider what the impact is down the road. And there are, there is some research to suggest um, like retention um, being tied into having access to a behavioral health expert in, in your clinic. And so, um, you know, the cost of hiring new um uh, physicians or providers is, is significant. And so I think retention is also something we don't often think about, but circles back to Dr. Danner's points of, um, how helpful this can be for the people like really on the front lines doing this work so uh, there's a question in the chat. Yeah. Yes. I, <laughs> how moderating works is I will read all the questions and then <laughs> direct us to answer them. Um, the question about integrated behavioral health. I mean, yes, more is better, but it, I think the as a primary care provider, the part that's tricky for me, I go into Epic, boop, 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 I click a bunch of boxes and it just goes off into the ether. 
I don't know who's going to receive it. I don't know if they're going to feel my sense of urgency. Yes, I pick a box saying how urgent it is. And that that's the whole beauty of integrated behavioral health is you know the person, you have relationships. So you can say, hey, I know you just got 10 referrals, but actually this one, we got to get them bumped up and here's why. And the receiving mental health professional knows you well enough to know that you don't ask for somebody to be bumped up unless they really need it. So I think, you know, relationship within the care team is great. And of course, just having more therapy um, is better. That's huge waiting list everywhere. Um, I wanted to address the thing in the chat about ADHD, just to um, make sure uh the, I would say that pediatricians actually are moderately to very comfortable making a diagnosis of straightforward ADHD using Vanderbilt's and good history taking. I think that uh, when it's a mixed picture, anxiety plus ADHD, autism plus ADHD, we're still um, referring people out for neuropsychology testing. So I think the um, places where those most of the content of those consultations is usually ADHD plus something else or ADHD med questions. Lots of ADHD med questions, especially with all the shortages or ADHD and sleep problems. Um, so I think that one is less a diagnostic problem, but more a um, treatment problem. I don't know if the consultants would agree that that's mostly what you're facing. I think there's a lot of question or a lot of um, consultation too around if we're making these diag diagnoses or helping folks make these diagnoses, what's needed. So one of the things to your point, Dr. Borman Shop, about the resources available is we've had many conversations about, you know, what is a neuropsychology evaluation and what specifically is needed. And if it's a fairly straightforward ADHD question or if it's a ADHD versus anxiety, likely the child doesn't necessarily need a full neuropsych evaluation, which can be a year or two wait. Um, and so helping folks understand, first of all, what they're referring for and then where they're referring to uh, based on those needs, I think can be really helpful. Um, but to your point too, on the therapy side, um, you know, I think, and this kind of goes back to one of the previous questions about how IBH models can help with the therapy, the long, long therapy waits. One of the things that we're doing that we didn't highlight as, as much on these slides here is, is also giving tips and tricks, right? So there's lots of different things that we can do in the moment um, that providers can do in their well child visits uh, to give parents some coaching around even positive attention, right? So talking about like, that here's a great way to, to give positive attention to a child who's bouncing off the walls in, in your um, visit. And you can also just as an aside say, hey, mom, did you notice when I, you know, really praised him for sitting in his seat, um, his face just lit up, right? And then you've you've not only given a skill to the trainee or the, the provider, but you've given a skill to the parent if they're then taking that into the room. So there's lots of things like that where we're giving kind of tips and tricks that are more behaviorally based. Um, that we can have folks start to use, have families start to use. And then especially while they're waiting for those long waits for the ongoing care, we can kind of have them come back, have them track um, kind of how the progress is going with some of these tips and tricks and at least give them something to go on while they're while they're in that wait process. I would, um, yeah, Dr. Langers, thank you for sharing that. I would say the one other thing to, um, to, to highlight about the ADHD question is um, kind of similar to my comment about the psychosis question is oftentimes like children are coming in, the teacher said they have ADHD or the gym or the, you know, their basketball coach said they have ADHD. And, and oftentimes that's an opportunity for us to sit down and do some teaching around. Yes. Um, what, what are we seeing? Yes. That maybe meets criteria. If you check the boxes on the Vanderbilt, what are all the other things we need to be thinking about to make sure that we've also considered and are ruled out before we make that diagnosis? And so it does come up a lot and it's a really great teaching opportunity for us to think about um, how we actually go about solidifying that diagnosis and making sure we're not um, we're not missing other things. Great. Um, kind of a question and an idea from the chat um, from Dr. Luber. As an adult psychiatrist, I worked on site in primary care clinics for many years. Another piece of integrated care is to have the residents rotate with the mental health professional for half a day per week when the clinic provider asks for a psychiatry consult on site. Um, and I think we had some kind of natural bi-directional exchange that happened with um, some elective experiences that um, Dr. Steingraber was offering. And 
Um, there's a lot of other wonderful educational opportunities that are happening within the Division of Child Psychiatry that we didn't have time to cover today through the EPAC program and other things. But I think that um, like seeing each other's worlds, I think is one of the most powerful parts of the work that we're doing are, you know, coming, being embedded in a primary care clinic, you see the pace, you see the kinds of complaints. And then for the primary care providers to go and be embedded in a mental health setting for a period of time, I think could be quite powerful as well. Yeah. And that's part of the psych rotation for family medicine residents is they spend time with Dr. Lingris seeing patients in her clinic. They spend time with me seeing patients in my clinic. They spend some time with adult psychiatry, but they I haven't had the opportunity to have them sit in with child psychiatry. So if there's any child psychiatrists out there that want family medicine residents to come learn with you, I'm sure you'd have some takers. It's a great model. The other thing I would add is that informally this is happening because, for example, if somebody is finishing up their note on a cough and they're hearing another discussion get going about SSRI, they may say, you know what, I've got a question about that too. So they're getting pulled in naturally to discussions that are happening because we're just increasing the amount of mental health discussion in the precepting space every day that we're there. So... And I would say this is also happening from the faculty preceptor level, which I think is really telling. And this kind of gets to, to Dr. Schmidt's question that we'll get to in a second. But one of our biggest barriers I think that we all run into is just time, right? It's a busy clinic. There's lots of patients to see. And so the fact that faculty preceptors are not only aware that we're there, but many times are saying, you know, if we're not already having an ear towards a conversation, they will pull us in and say, oh, you know what? We're talking about a, a child here, you know, Dr. Lingris, Dr. Schlesinger, can you come join us? Um, and so the fact that we're on their minds and we're becoming part of this conversation, I think, is, is also really telling as to how integrated it's getting, not only for the learners, but for folks who've been practicing for, you know, 10, 20 years, too. Yeah, people at my clinic, like, wait for the afternoon when the consultants are going to be there, They're like, oh, is Amanda here yet? And, they, and it's the on-demand nature is, like, extremely helpful because the psychiatry assistance line is a great resource that many of us use, but it's still takes planning and scheduling and when you've got a busy clinic schedule and you're just not sure when you're going to get a break sometimes that feels like too much activation injury energy so to know that when it works for you you will be able to get the coaching and help you need has been um really powerful um, i'm just going to add the one piece quickly about i i think I don't think I've ever had anyone say, no, thank you. I don't want your input, even if I've inserted myself. But I do think there was a bit of a learning process too, just thinking about well, like Dr. Borman show up, these clinics are busy, like seeing like the volume of patients that our primary care providers are seeing in an afternoon. So being really thoughtful about before you dive into like all of the things in your head saying, you know, do you have, how much time do you have? Do you have 30 seconds? Do you have two minutes? Do you not have any time now? Can, can I come back in a little bit of time was I think really important for us to build into how we approach consults in that clinic model. Yeah. I think one other piece that, that we didn't highlight um, in the very beginning of all this work was really having champions in, a, in all of these settings, right? So I've been in lots of different integrated behavioral setting, behavioral health kind of settings across different states, and there's a wide range of acceptability and interest in this. I think there's certainly um, growing interest across the board. You know, historically, there was a time where people were not interested in hearing from psychologists or mental health folks um, in the primary care setting. And I think we're moving much further away from that. But um, but even, you know, within the sort of range of acceptability and, and interest, um, again, there's people who kind of go right to the barriers and there's people who are, you know, at the other end of the continuum saying, I really want this. We've been chopping at the bit for this for months and years. Um, and so one of the things that we found that really eases that, um, that, entry point is having champions. So like Dr. Borman Shope in the pediatric clinic, Dr. Danner in the family medicine clinic, um, Dr. Friedrich and, and Ben Beck in nursing, um, they're all there saying, here's what this program is, here's what it can offer, here's what it can bring you in your regular day-to-day -day practice. And so before we even walk in the door physically or virtually, people are know who we are and what we do. And they have kind of that relational currency the same way we rely on that for those warm handoffs. We've had that as consultants when um, the people who are already on the ground in those clinics are kind of talking us up and talking about the program and really um, getting that anticipation and, and awareness of our program out there so that um, we're able to, to kind of hit the ground running both relationally and, and with the content. Um. Yeah, absolutely. I want to just call out a really thoughtful comment by um, 
Dr. Resch, which I'll put in the chat so everybody can see it and I'll read it out as well. Um, just uh, saying, I think a lot of training moving to remote appointments, remote of work, especially during 2020, led to some loss of that learning uh, from your colleagues. As someone who did my intern year in 2020, I felt like I was missing that informal learning that happens in the hallways and in the workrooms. Having specialists on site would certainly facilitate more of those unexpected learning moments between providers. And I, I think that is absolutely what they see. And I think it's also that you can take advantage of it if you're ready to for that day, right? Sometimes the residents might just want to get all their notes done and they focus up and they sort of stick with it. But almost always I can just literally see them like, oh, actually, I want to learn about this. And they sort of like gravitate down towards the end where the consultant is sitting. And I think it it just makes it a really um, rich and collaborative learning environment, which has been fun to be a part of. And relationships matter, like going, you know, down the hall to talk to Dr. Steingraber, who you've talked to before and have found her to be useful and friendly and non-judgmental <laughs> and all of those things, right? Makes a difference as opposed to calling some line and getting some person you don't know and you don't know how they're going to respond and how quickly they'll get back to you, all of that. So, I mean, relationships matter in this education too. And we were, you know, it was also interesting to see how that blossoms also in advocacy, because, for example, like then our chief resident was like, this is useful. I want it to continue. Did a great job testifying. Now she's in fellowship. She's excited about thinking about how mental health fits into her future, you know, work with kids. You know, we're really increasing the number of people who are interested in this. And we've also thought we're increasing the number of people who want to see this in future clinics where they work. They ask for it and they preferentially apply for jobs where that exists. Yes, time to wrap up. All right, well, th I, I will say thanks for having me. It's uh, our pediatric grand rounds is at 7.30 on Wednesday mornings. There may be topics of interest to some of you. So, uh, uh, I'll put in a shameless plug for another department's Grand Round series. Uh, check that out anytime. And um, uh, I will say that your department is lucky to have so many amazing faculty members who I uh, really love working with. So thanks for having me and for all the work that all of you are doing. And thank you on behalf of our, our team. You've heard from many of us today, but um, as you heard, we're missing a few folks too, but really just, you know, representing across disciplines. I think this has been a really lovely opportunity for all of us to, to come together and share with you. Um, and certainly we're all available for further questions or, or consultations later on as well, if this is a, a topic of interest to you all. So thank you all for your time.